Hi, I'm Patrick Pond, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to this show is that Favro customers are some of the most innovative companies in the world. Enterprises wanting to be more agile, software as a service companies scaling fast, and game developers and publishers wanting to master live ops. So we get to know some truly inspiring leaders in product development, marketing, operations, sales, executive management. And what we do here is that we interview them about leadership so we can all learn from them. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to the show. And today I got two very special guests. I got two guests, not just one, you know, uh, Ben and Aaron. Uh, welcome to the show. Good to be Glad here. Glad to be here. You know that uh, your podcast, uh, uh, you know, Building Better Games is actually one of my favorites. Um, I wish that um, every producer in the game industry was listening to that. That that would make um, that would make my job easier, and I think it would make um, a lot of um, you know simply much better games. You know, but uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more into that because the, the theme of today is you know you know what are the state of you know production practices in the industry. It's a very um, it's a very uh, you know big topic, and I think the two of you are. <laughs> Uh, some of the best I could interview around that, and I, I hope you're not gonna, you know, hold back. You know, you, you know, we. This, this is the time to put uh, the opinions out there. Um, but uh, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, what led you up to, you know, where you are today. I mean, basically your your origin story, you know, what you've done before, and you know, maybe you can say a little bit about your your business today. Uh, my name is Aaron Smith. Uh, I grew up in a small country town where playing video games was not cool and not appreciated by my friends and family. Uh, well, I should, my friends actually appreciate it. My family did not. And so I didn't think it was a viable career choice. So I went into film, went to college for film, uh, did some production work in LA in the film industry for a, a brief stint, uh, and realized I just hated it. It was not my tribe. It was not the work that I preferred. And I joined this tiny little company called Riot Games that I had never heard of making a, uh, quote unquote knockoff of Dota. And I was excited about that. And I was getting coffee and sandwiches for the CEO and the president for the first six months and earning my keep. And the rest is history. So 10, 15 years later, um, I left the company as a, as a director and learned a ton there. Um, thank God for that opportunity. And uh, now I'm running a consultancy with Ben where we take all of those learnings and best practices and we're trying to really have an impact on the industry at large. Yeah, I mean, it hit mine go ahead all right um so yeah my name's ben um let's see i also grew up in a small town but in a, on a different coast i was in new york and went in got a computer and systems engineering degree very long time ago immediately went into the army uh via rotc so never really used my degree um then got trained as a combat arms officer i was uh on tanks and humvees then i went into the army and never used that either <laughs> um, and ended up doing mostly logistics for a few years, uh, one, one overseas. Um, and finally found myself at Riot Games because I was playing League of Legends. I didn't know who made it at the time. And I was leaving the army because, uh, similar to Aaron, it was, it just wasn't a culture fit for me. So I threw out some resumes and was like, Hey, uh, these aren't going to get any response, but I'll try. And Riot actually got back to me. They, um, I survived the interview process, which was not a trivial thing, uh, and then spent, yeah, a little over eight years there going from associate producer, and I didn't know what VFX was, and I didn't know anything about anything about making games, but I'd been playing them my whole life, uh, all the way to, you know, later where I was actually responsible for organizing and setting up the discipline, you know, making sure that we interviewed and brought in great people and all sorts of things when it came to production and uh, the sub-discipline of production development management. Then left because I was really way more interested and also felt I was better at helping other leaders succeed versus like leading stuff myself that just wasn't as, as engaging for me. But I loved helping others and teaching and training and mentoring. And so left to go see if I could do that with Aaron. Um, and we've been doing that for the last few years, talking to game studios all over the place. I have a passion for leadership and how it applies in the game dev space. You know, I have to you know ask you something. Um, I recently did a podcast to you know with uh, 
you know, with the, with the guys from, uh, you know, Sprocket Games and, you know, there's, mm-hmm. uh, there's a bit of, you know, similar background there with, you know, with, with Riot mm-hmm. and, and, you know, one of the things that they said in, uh, in, in the podcast that I really liked, they said that it was like, there were so many, you know, great things around, you know, practices that they learned that they really wanted to, to bring with them to this, you know, new company. Uh, but they also had a lot of ideas around, well, there's also things that we think, you know, can be done different and, and, you know, there's, there's a, you know, there's a better way basically. And they also mm-hmm. wanted yeah. to put that into, into how they, they're going to build this company and this culture. Do you feel a bit the same or? Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's true everywhere. I actually, I don't believe in the idea of an ideal org. You're always getting pros and cons. And the question for me is always, are the pros worth the cons? For me, Riot very much was, and recognizing that also there were weaknesses um, mm-hmm. inside of the leadership culture there. Um, and now that I've been out in the industry, I'm like, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere has, has weaknesses. But um, uh, and it wasn't... Been specifically, since I also have a little bit of a, you know, of a military background, uh, are, are there things that you learn in the military that you are able now to, to, to apply also with, you know, when you're, when you're helping, uh, you know, studios? I, yes. Um, I didn't, it was funny, I was pretty negative about my military experience for a decent amount of time. I was just like, ah, I wasn't a culture fit, I don't know. But as I've spent more time away from it, I realized a lot of things I learned, um, including leadership, uh, around leadership. Um, There were some good examples of leadership, there were bad examples of leadership, but it is a highly leadership-oriented organization. um, Mm -hmm. And it's huge, like the scale of it is huge. And so you think about, you know, in a game studio, if you're 10,000, that's a giant studio. And the military was 1.6 million. How do you create effective process for 1.6 million people? That's very difficult, um, I guess, to put it lightly. And you have a different set of constraints. And so my respect for the military has actually gone up after I left. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the leadership lessons that I learned there, um, clarity of communication, being focused on the people you're leading and not yourself, um, mission focus, like goal orientation, um, recognizing the situation you're in. So are you in a situation where you have to make a decision right now and everybody needs to follow you uh, because you're the leader and that's something that sometimes leaders have to do? Uh, that happens when you're deployed somewhat frequently. Um, and in games, it doesn't happen as much, but it can still pop up here and there. Or are you in a situation where you have time to stop and go, wait, let's understand what's going on. Let's make a decision at the last responsible moment, uh, that sort of thing. And so a lot of that um, is I pulled with me from the military. All right, cool. So, so let's jump into today's topic, you know, the, the, the state of production practices in, you know, in the industry. And I, I kind of want to kick it off with a, you know, with a, with a, with a reflection that I, that I made, you know, because, you know, before, uh, um, you know, before Favro, you know, I was, I was building another company called Handsoft, you know, where it was also about, you know, you know, production management in, initially, most in the game industry. So I was, I was, I was super involved, uh, you know, with, you know, that, that problem, so to say, you know, you know, how to, how to mm-hmm. make production better, you know, for, for many years, um, and, and, you know, very active in, you know, the, you know, the speaking scene and all that. And, and mm-hmm. I thought you know, a lot of those conversations, a lot of the visits I had, you know, with studios, you know, helping them, it was, it was so much fun and it was very interesting. And then I kind of, you know, get a little bit away from the industry for a while because I had, I had a team taking care of that. And I was personally focusing a little bit more on our customers in, in telecom and aerospace, defense, so forth. Um, and, and, you know, then when we started, you know, you know, Favro and at the same time, I also started to, to, you know, you know, invest a lot in games. Uh, so, so, you know, full force back into, into the game industry. And one reflection I made is that when it comes to production, not not much have happened. You know, it's like it's kind of like same problem still being discussed, yeah. you know, ten or fifteen years mm-hmm. ago. And and I was actually a bit surprised by that because that's you know there's so many other things where the industry have evolved a lot. And uh, to be honest, it's it's actually a bit you know disheartening. Um, I actually thought that you know I would kind of come back and things would would have you know uh, evolved more, and you know we could kind of you know pick up you know there and, and continue into the future. Um, so, so I was, I was, let's say a li- little bit disappointed, and of course, you know, that that's also a business opportunity when you are in the business of trying to make that better, you know, both mm-hmm. through, you know, practices and, and tools. Mm-hmm. Um, but, 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 but still, you know, that, that's a reflection I made. So I kind of want to start with, with that and, and just see what, what's your take on the, on the, you know, the, the state of production. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give a couple of brief one to two liners about observations Ben and I have made. Um, there is, uh, 
I, I think a general misunderstanding of the nature of game production as a topic. Uh, I think when most people hear the phrase game production or production, they think the thing that producers do. And what we're trying to get leaders in games to understand is that game production is a meta skill set and a, a focus area that any leader should have some understanding of. Um, it, it is kind of bizarre that the idea of how games are made as a topic is something seen to be relegated as in, in a producer box and that nobody really has to care about it or thinks about it or needs to understand it except for producers. Um, another trend we see is producers as sort of assistants, taskmasters, or party organizers, sort of people who are just greasing the wheels 24 seven and don't have any real responsibility, uh, authority, decision-making capability, uh, or leadership potential. Um, and the, the worst part of all is, uh, there's a, a vicious cycle between organizations incentivizing producers to behave that way and producers feeling unsatisfied and unfulfilled and not growing in those ways and then falling even more into those traps. Uh, I think it is true, generally speaking, that producers in the games industry are rewarded for creating plans, managing workflows, keeping track of all the tasks, making sure people are doing stuff all the time. Like these things are the things that produce uh, that we've seen directors of production who have been in that space for so long that their capabilities don't go outside of that space. They've been doing it for 20 years and their solution to everything is to make another spreadsheet. And, and it's, and it's tragic because you, when you talk to these people, you can see the frustration and the, and, and at times the lack of fulfillment that they get out of their jobs because they feel like they can't really have a broader impact than that. Um, and the last one I'll mention is generally we see organizations and, and this has actually got worse since the pandemic. And I think worse since, uh, the, uh, industry has depressed a little bit financially in the last 18 to 24 months over obsession on process and workflow and task level efficiency, as opposed to alignment and vision game vision like you know we'll, we'll go into a company and they'll talk to us about how badly they want a better task tracking system and then we'll interview 15 of their key leaders across a hundred person organization we'll ask them the question what game are you making and we'll get 15 different answers or i don't know and that's terrifying you know multi multi-million or double digit million dollar projects yeah yeah um I can I can add into that, but if you had any questions, Patrick, go ahead. No, I, I definitely do, but you know, go ahead, Ben. Um, the I I loved what Aaron called out at the beginning because I, I remember showing up again straight out of the military, and here I am, I'm pushed pu pushed onto the champion team, and um, because I wasn't actually I was going to be on this competitive team or something else, and anyway, they were like, hey, well, you know what, you've done logistics in the military, you can do the champion team. Those things are not at all the same, um, but uh, figured it out. And one of the things I remember going in and asking is, hey, can anybody give me the workflow of how a champion gets made? And nobody knew it end to end, even the producers on the team. Um, they were all so busy, so overwhelmed that they just like everybody kind of knew their piece and what the inputs to them were and what the outputs were. And there was this broad understanding of like, here's the flow. But if you were to go and say like, hey, who's the person who knows all of the, how this flows through the system? Um, no one would know that. And when I think about that, when it comes to games, this was an example of a, a group of people that were working very hard and constantly. And I was the first person, I think, to actually put that down. I had it on like a little piece of lined paper. And I just would like, I just went to each discipline and I was like, okay, what's the input for you? What's the output? And when Aaron was talking about game production, that is the thing, like how, what does it mean to actually make a game? What does it mean mm -hmm. for it to move through the phases? It's this weird thing where Everybody in games has a default of, well, I'm going to do my piece. So make sure I have the inputs to my piece. I'm going to do them really well. I'm going to craft, I'm going to be a craft expert. I'm going to create a high quality thing that, you know, is going to be something that is going to amaze the players from the perspective of animation or design or narrative or whatever. And then I'm going to hand it to the people I hand it to. And I don't have broader awareness. And I think some of that is because they don't have time. Um, they're not given time so often in game studios. They're just working so hard. It's just as soon as they finish one thing, they're on to the next thing. 
But the other is that no one's incentivizing them to actually understand Mm -hmm. what does it look like to know how the other steps work and how do we understand to, to, again, Darren's point about workflow, where our bottlenecks are and how could I help? And I I had one, um, I brought this up a few times, but I had one concept artist who was like that, who did want to understand the big picture and how, like how this all went together. And despite the fact that he was a concept artist, which is very much the beginning of the pipe, he went and tried to figure out how he could help the VFX artists and animators because he knew they were overwhelmed. And so he would just do sketches for them and help them. Basically, it helped them ideate faster because he could sketch stuff faster than they could mock it up in the game because of the the tools that we were using at that time. Um, And that was an example of someone using their game production knowledge to assist a part of the pipeline that wasn't their own, right? None of what he did was going to go in his CV or be you know, published into the game or anything. It was just to help the team move forward. And so that is game production is seeing that and being able to understand how that's flowing. I do um, also agree with Aaron that game producers, that is something we should all be very proficient in. And if what we're doing instead is thinking that our craft and our expertise is the making of plans and processes or the scheduling of the food, or again, just telling everybody what to do based on a giant Gantt chart that we created six months ago or someone else created six months ago. That's a mistake. It's actually about seeing that big picture, orienting others towards the goal that that big picture is aiming for, and then helping them along the way. You're a force multiplier. You're not a task manager. All right. So I have to I have to ask a question here because you were you were kind of hinting several times towards, you know, part of the problem here is that, you know, you know, what producers are being rewarded for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, you, you know, you, you kind of called out, um, you know, the workflow, right? You know, do, do you actually, you know, do you know the workflow? And, and you know, we also talked about a big picture. I mean, I would use the word alignment, you know, here. Um, yep. Now, you know, if, if I just, you know, take my perspective, if I compare, um, you know, a, a, a mediocre workflow uh, for, for doing a certain thing, you know, let's say doing, you know, a, a certain, you know, type of art, uh, and you compare that to, to a good one, and, you, and, and even better, you compare that to when you have, you know, leaders that are good, at consistently analyzing the bottlenecks and 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 constantly improving these workflows. If you compare those two scenarios, the difference, especially when you do this at scale, uh, is massive. You know, if you just look at you know time and money, and then you know just generally speaking about alignment. If you compare a team where you know everyone you know they don't really you know know and and they're just not aligned. Uh, and, and you know the, the enormous amount of waste in in, in you know, time yes. and money there compared to a team which is aligned. You know, there's if we just can translate this to time to market and dollars, it's such yeah. massive differences. How yeah. can how can it be that this is not rewarded when there's so much money on the table? I I I think what you've just commented on, and and to me this is the rub, right? This is the the elephant in the room. The thing you've just commented on is a meta idea that I think we, for some reason, we're just not getting in game development. And I think it's the smaller, newer, more nimbler studios that are running circles around the bigger studios on this subject. And also on top of that, we've got UGC content, if you will. And, and, and I'm, when I say UGC content, I'm talking about like uh, PUBG starting as an Arma 2 mod, um, running circles around some of the big studios as well. Um, there is a failure to understand how games are made or a refusal to acknowledge how games are made, which is highly iterative, very discovery focused. Again, we're talking about workflows right now. Workflows are great, but no like 80, 20 rule, right? Like there's no amount of effective workflow management that's going to necessarily create a good feature or build a great game. Um, and, and that's the thing we, we Ben made this post on LinkedIn that I constantly reference a couple months back where he said, stop treating game development like we're building chairs. There's this, there's an obsession and an incentive all the way from the top of these studios to turn game development into some tailorist factory floor approach to work. And so these producers and and actually a lot of these other leaders, there's this feeling of insecurity and angst that's present until there's a document somewhere that tells people what the next task they need to work on is and then they can start working and then now we feel comfortable yeah and so and and that's not the point those tools are there to serve to your point the the outcome of an aligned clear vision that we're all moving towards 
And that, and by the way, and that's evolving every day as well. But like that, we, I think broadly speaking, we have not figured out how to build that into our, our studios yet. And so in lieu of that, we feel anxiety and insecurity. And what we do is we replace, we, we fix that anxiety and insecurity by putting plans and documents and meetings and all this corporate stuff in place, workflows, all this stuff. So we cart, cart before the horse. I mean, what's your recipe for, for fixing it? So the, the big one that I, I talk about when I'm introducing concepts like these to leaders is you, your job is not to instantly resolve the uncertainty through a plan or through some like, well, okay, hang on, wait, wait, everybody just estimate and I'll put it in a giant Gantt chart and now we'll know what's going to happen for the next six months. I'm like, if you follow that plan, you are in almost every case doing the wrong thing. Because as Aaron pointed out, this is creative work. We need to learn. So the thing is, your job is not to immediately remove the uncertainty as a leader. It's to embrace the fact that there is uncertainty and help your teams be comfortable with that uncertainty. And I mean that all the way up from uh, the C-level down to the team level lead. One of your jobs is, is to go, hey, there's some stuff we don't know, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we don't eventually resolve that uncertainty. But it does mean that we don't pretend while we're ideating or prototyping a game that we know how many people we're going to need in post-production and which artist is going to be working on which asset to get something done. That's ridiculous. You know, it's yeah. interesting what you said there. It reminds me about um, a production keynote I did you know, ages ago at, uh, at the conference where you know, I was trying to explain why, why you know, a much more iterative approach is great when you're doing something with such a high level of uncertainty as, mm -hmm. as, as making a game compared to a very traditional pro with, you know, with a big fat GAN schedule. And I said, let's say that you are doing, you're doing that GAN schedule perfect, and then you are following it perfectly, and you, you, you ship it on exactly that date. Now, did you make the best game you possibly could have done with that, you know, you know those people and, and, and that money? Well, no. So, yeah. you know, I, and I actually used some Lego pieces, you know, to, to explain this. And, and on that note, I mean, this is where I need to throw in, um, you know, a question to you, because I was, uh, one of your most recent podcasts, uh, you know, had a title, I think the title was like, why agile is failing your team. And I was, you know, when I was going to listen is, uh, you know, I was like, uh Oh, you know, because you know, my background is very much, you know, so, so, you know, coming from the agile community and, and, you know, we were, you know, very enthusiastic about this in game development, you know, if, if, you know, go back many years, you know, you know, mm -hmm. you know, something to handle, you know, high level uncertainty. Hmm, well, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm, uh, you mm -hmm. know, more cross-functional teams. Well, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, delivering increments of value. Well, you know, you do want to have a playables, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, you know, the game industry was doing, I mean, I remember I was doing a, a you know, a talk some years ago with Don Daglo. And, you know, when we had our pre-talk, pre you know, he was like, well, we kind of did this already in the 80s. It's just that we didn't call it agile, uh, but mm -hmm. it was, you know, highly, highly iterative and, 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 you know, increments of value. So anyways, um, so I was, I was thinking, you know, you know, what's, what, what's going to, what's going to come here, you know, when I listen to this podcast and, you know, you, you started by describing this, you know, you know, very, very dark image of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, kind of conflict, fric friction, resentment. Then you go a little bit into what's going on. It seems like a lot of these things have kind of been hijacked by, you know, middle managers that, you know, have kind of understood that agile is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a buzzword. So they, they slap that on, but, but they're actually doing practices that are extremely non-agile. Yes. And, and then, you know, my, my, my heart got a little bit lighter because, you know, later in this, well, basically the majority of this whole podcast, you know, you get into a couple of practices, uh, on how to do things right. That, you know, that were really, really good. So I would, I would encourage anyone, you know, to, to listen to this, uh, to this uh, podcast. But, um, my question to you is kind of like, well, you know, how did we, how, how did we get there? Because, you know, it was more optimism around this before. And, and now, I mean, I, I come across this too, you know, where people actually are very negative as soon as you, I purposely do not use the word agile much anymore. I, I, I try to use different words, but, but to describe mm -hmm. kind of like the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you asked uh, a, a question earlier, which was, okay, well, what do we do to sort of skirt this trend or, or try to reverse things? And I think the answer is the same. It speaks to both, which is we need leaders to focus on decisions, outcomes, and behaviors. So like when Ben and I go to producers, we say, hey, you, you already think a lot about the process. So we're gonna put that aside for now. What we want you to think about 
is how are the people. So when like, let's take a meeting, for example, how are people behaving in that meeting? And, and the problem is when most leaders look at something like scrum, for example, they go, okay, well, it's these seven steps. It's these, I, I set up these meetings. I make these documents. I make the burn down chart. People say these three things in the meeting, in the 15 minute meeting. Um, and they, they're not thinking about it critically. They're just following the steps. And again, that's what you're doing when you constantly go back to that. Okay. How do I tailorize this? Right. How do I turn this into an assembly line? You're not thinking about what you're actually trying to get out of that 15 minute meeting. So a silly little example Ben and I talk about all the time is the big standup where everyone was supposed to say if they were green or red. And if you said you were red, no one would help you. There would be no clear follow-up, no clear decisions made based on that information, and possibly you would get yelled at in front of the group. So guess what happened? All of a sudden, everyone was green all the time. But if you went outside of the stand-up and you started asking everybody what their status was, they're like, oh, we're all screwed. We all know that the project's months <laughs> behind. Yet in the meeting, everyone's saying they're green. And then the project manager's feeling all great, like everything's on track. And this is exactly the point, right? Like a discerning leader goes in there and says, it's not about the three specific things that the person needs to say. It's not about whether the meeting is 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It's about being clear for all of us, what are we trying to get out of this? What decisions do we want to make based on this? And then having that be the nucleus of that artifact or, or, or ritual or whatever it is. We, we had a great conversation with um, John Eric uh, Khalife, and he's been doing tools development for a long time. And he said, we make a mistake in tools development a lot in game dev. We go in and we, we go like, okay, let's say we've got 20 artists and 30 engineers and 15 designers and four narrative and whatever. And we look at their tools and we say, we think that we can add 20% back to the engineers, 30% back to the artists, you know, 15%. And we run the numbers and we say, so the most efficient tool we could build is this one. That gets us the most sort of people hours back every month. And we, they go and they do that and they're like, yay, look at all this money we saved. And what they didn't look at is where's the bottleneck in the system? What is it that we have trouble hiring? What is it that we actually need more of uh, when it comes to assets created? No, 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 we don't, we don't think about that. And, and for me, when I orient around this question of like what went wrong, we became obsessed with efficiency. And it wasn't just games, it was tech broadly in some ways and it's the world broadly. We lock onto the thing we can measure which is widgets over the line on the other side. And we go, well, if I'm the art producer, let's say I'm a disciplined mm. organization, how do I get my artists making more art assets? And if I do that, I can put it on my resume, increase the artist output by 40%, and I can tell that to my manager and I can get a raise and a promotion and it's really measurable and it's really easy. The fact that we didn't need any more art assets and probably didn't even need all the ones we were making never enters into the equation because we're not thinking about value. We're not thinking about the goal. We're focused on our little piece that we're like, okay, can I make this better? And so what John Eric did, um, to go back to that tools example, he looked at it and he said, well, shoot, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of designers and there's all these other things, but the thing we can't hire and the thing we're most struggling with is VFX. And so even though I can't get the same dramatic return of people hours per month, the reality is that's what we need to improve. And so he pivoted everything towards like, how do I help them go faster? Because I'm trying to unblock this system for value creation, not just optimize anything that seems slow. And one of the ways I talk about this one is efficiency versus effectiveness. There's a million ways to be efficient. You can be efficient with time. You can be efficient with people. You can be efficient with money, other resources. You can be efficient with quality, you can, like whatever it is, number of assets you need to make, all these different things you can be efficient with. And so when people say, oh, I made the team much more efficient, I'm like, okay, did that matter? Did it help you be effective? Which it was you, you and your team's ability to meet and exceed their goals. And oftentimes when that question is asked, they're like, I don't even know what the goals are besides efficiency. And I'm like, yes, so that's a huge problem, right? And why don't you know? Because the, the reason we're in this spot, because everybody's been incentivized towards this thing they can measure, which is efficiency outputs. Did we follow the plan? You know, did we get more widgets over the line? And uh, 
uh, Aaron and I have spent a lot of time over the last three year, years talking to different studios who realized while they were talking to us, or and sometimes we observe, um, they're building a lot of stuff that's never going to get used. And everybody's really just, that's like normal state of affairs. And we're going like, wait a minute, stop trying to build more stuff. Try building less stuff that adds more value. You'll get there faster, you'll learn more, and you'll produce the better product. And it's exactly what you were saying earlier about like following the plan to the, to the T and building not as good a game. Yeah, that, that, you know, thanks. And, and maybe this ties into my next question, which is, um, what, one thing I'm, I'm picking up on, you know, now when, when the, you know, financial climate has been, you know, a little bit, a little bit challenging is that, um, th there's been, let's call it reverting to some more traditional practices. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have observed that, <clears throat> um, you know, maybe I think it's easier for, you know, newer studios, so that, you know, a, a new studio, um, you know, VC backed, you know, making their first game. Uh, I, I think in many ways they are in an easier situation mm -hmm. from, from at least, you know, this point of view versus if you're, if you're someone, I mean, typically a bigger organization that has an ongoing business, um, there's, um, you know, there's, there's two things happening here that I'm, I'm, I, I you know, I think I understand what's happening, but, but, but it's also confusing and I want to, I want to hear your take on it and, and, and it's the following. I mean, everything is going, you know, much more towards, you know, live service. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is putting constraint on organizations because it means that, you know, things are simply less linear. Um, and, yeah. and everything is, is you know, the, the, the cycle just spins much faster. And, and I mean, I just take my, my standard classical example that, you know, you, I can actually take it from a tool's point of view uh, because it's actually quite illust illustrative. So, you know, let's say that you have, you know, you know, you know, two teams, you know, working, um, you know, on, on, you know, on, on the product, um, you know, you know, again, this is very chromatic, but, you know, two teams work on a product, you know, let's say, you know, one, you know, I, you know, I come in and talk with them, you know, one is using Favro, we have another team, um, you know, they're using, they're using Jira, so, you know, they want to have that, that integration, you know, with Jira and, and Favro, uh, and and then you know they can basically use you know favor us as, as, as the way to, to do that and then those two interacting but here comes the thing then those guys need to interact and basically have collaborative planning on a very frequent basis you know with marketing operations community management and also management because management doesn't want to be you know out of the loop so so you know the, the whole you know the way the whole system needs to be in sync is is, is so much more uh it's, it's just so much more fast and, and yeah you know Everything about that situation uh, says that, you know, you need to be better at a lot of these, you know, practices. And at the same time, what I'm seeing is, is that a lot of organizations are actually going a little bit, uh, you know, they're going back to what they know. So I'm actually seeing, you know, more siloing. Mm. So it's like, yep. you know, when, when, you, when you the most need to break your organizational silos and get away from like very say, departmental and actually have, you know, much more collaboration, you know, between these two, you know, teams on, on, let's say, a peer level. Uh, you know, it actually becomes more like silos and throwing things over the wall. Yeah. More, you know, the things that you mentioned, you know, Ben, about, you know, you know, not looking at, are we doing the right thing, but just looking at, you know, how much are we cranking out here per, per, yeah. per hour. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, I, I can understand, you know, the human, the, the psychology behind it, you know, you, you know, when you're scared, you know, you go back to what you know, but at the same time, it is almost like capital destruction, you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, and actually, one of the things I love about the example you just gave, uh, you painted this picture of a team that has like 12 stakeholder touch points or customer touch points. And, you know, again, Ben and I go into that team, we start asking a bunch of questions. They say, well, hey, we need a project management system that can communicate and we need to have enough meetings and, and presentations and again, mechanical things to communicate all this data to all these people so that everyone has the data that we, that they need. One of the things Ben and I would do in that situation is say, show us a list of all your stakeholders. They would write it all down for us. And then we would go name by name and we'd ask, why is this person involved and what do they need? Why is that person involved and what do they need? And then one of the things we might recommend is half of these people should have, should not be involved in this. And we should sit down with them and say, your services are no longer required on this project. We love you. You're great at your job. Thank you. But you're, you're now out of the loop. Uh, if you want information, you will go and solicit it yourself, but we are no longer going to push it to you. 
So now we've removed half of the overhead, the communication overhead with stakeholders just by having a simple conversation. We didn't re-employ our project management infrastructure to make to 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 feed the bureaucratic beast that we had sort of found ourselves in. And and this is this is the point, right? Because because we took a step back away from the tools and the process and we looked at the problem at a slightly deeper level, not even like a super deep level, but just like why? Like we asked the question, why are all these people involved? Ben had this on some of his teams on League of Legends, where he had like 57 stakeholders or something like that on one of his projects. And then he, when he reflected that back to them, some of them just opted out. They're like, wow, I'm part of the problem here. Okay, <laughs> sorry, you don't have to give me information anymore. That's an organizational conversation. The question is, is the average leader in game development or, or, or maybe the average producer, if we're talking about structure, equipped to, to, to take on that leadership stance and ask the deeper question? Do they have the awareness to, to, to think about the problem in those terms? Do they have the training to process a problem and think critically about a problem in those terms? And, and the answer we see more often than not is no. And this is actually practically what we're talking about when we say producers should be leaders first. If you need the tools, use the tools. If you have a bunch of structure and that works, that's the solution, then use it. But th in this, this example, the problem is actually a people problem. It's an organization problem. Solve that. And then you, you now solve 10 other upstream or downstream problems as well, right? And I, I'm going to, you know, and Patrick, maybe you'll appreciate this. I'm going to plug Favreau for a second. One of the reasons I liked it when I worked at Riot was because it was light, weight, and fast to interact with. And I could get it out to a group of people and I could do a bunch of different random things on it. And I would just like create something. And sometimes I would just create it once, show it to people and it would be dead and I'd throw it away. And other times it would be an ongoing board that I would use. And like that flexibility was a response to an environment where, yes, there were people that were like, no, we need a detailed everything. And I was like, no, we don't. Because the, the problem you're trying to solve is how do we get all these people this information? And I'm going how do we actually just get the right people in the room mm -hmm. to talk about this together? Yeah. How do we have a high fidelity conversation? Right. Exactly. And, and if you focus there and, and you know, that we have a, a thing we call the holistic leadership model and what Aaron was just talking about, those are cultural things. Those are cultural things around how teams relate to stakeholders and they engage with each other. And there's process elements in there, but a lot of that's cultural. Um, when you show up to a team, do you just accept everything about that team or do you go, okay, what's healthy about this and what's not? What's, where, are we going in the right direction? Are we aligned to value or are, are, or are we not? We're just um, making and, stuff. And <laughs> then once I answer those questions, I can go over and I can say, okay, where's the process at? Is it supporting the culture I want to create? Is it supporting the goal and aligning to it? And so many of the things, the tools that are out there just are, were so much they were so much bigger and more complex and it was like you could get a phd in how to like use this tool and it just killed me because there were people who were producers and they were like this is my job what i do is i manage this tool and i'm like no you lead your team you keep them culturally healthy you keep them moving to the same objective you get those stakeholders to be helping and supporting in that and leveraging them for the value they add not try to figure out how to play some sort of shadow boxy game with which is the next stakeholder that's going to come in and poop all over my team's work. And then, yes, you use process to support those things. And by the way, like a, a great, like Ben and I have both been in situations where we've seen uh, sort of producer roundups where we're talking, we're having our, we're in promotion season, right? Where we're talking about like, who's going to get a raise, who's going to get a promotion and seeing scenarios where it's like, okay, everyone's off track, their projects. Teams are blaming each other for problems instead of collaborating. Um, we missed most of our deadlines in the last six months. Um, we have poor visibility over where people are at or what the problems are. And often when confronted with the problems, producers are, are covering them up or ignoring them as opposed to actively changing or fixing things. And then, and then we see a situation where somebody's done a great job managing the tool and they get a promotion. Like you asked the incentive question earlier. We see this stuff all the time. It's like, so when, when, when this, the studio is rewarding people for managing and for getting stuff done and making the tools and the data and all that stuff good, but the, 
the 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 actual infrastructure is rotting from the inside out that that tells you everything you need to know right there there's almost like the you know the classic example of like you know measured on i mean this is a trivial example but it's, a, it's an old joke you know like being measured on how many lines of code you wrote yeah <laughs> you know, exactly that's all the problem yeah you know, yes you get that culture i mean you have a yeah. dying organization because then you know, you're going to end up with a very large code base in a very yeah. unnecessary yeah. horrible situation. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a lot of white space. A lot of, but there is, of white space where you're going. <laughs> there is a really visceral satisfaction to that, right? Like we've all been in those like big staff meetings where like everyone's got their huge like Google Slides deck with all the charts. Look at these charts. I don't know what they mean. I don't know why you're showing them to me. And I don't know what the hell we're going to do with any of this information. But holy cow, do those charts look cool. That one says like, plus 150%. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be good. No, it, it's all the time. I want to jump back, though, because you, you brought up earlier, and I think you nailed the root of it, right? Why are we reverting to an older, like more traditional approach to game dev when live service and iteration is more important than ever? And I th one, the root cause is, I think, fear. You called that out. You were mm -hmm. like, crap, let's go back to what I know. Let's, you know what? Hey, we, we once built a game and it worked like this. If nothing else, and this is an interesting one, even if, if, if we follow the plan, there will probably be a game at the end. Yeah. Whether it's good or not, totally different story, but at least there will be a game. And it resolves a lot of this uncertainty for me, right? So that feels good. And so like, let's just go back to the traditional method and we're not going to, you know, going to go back to like, pulling branches out of Maine and doing integration weeks and all this, like, again, stuff that we should be way mm -hmm. past in game debt, broadly speaking. Um, I want to, I want to hit one other element of that. Let me see. I think it's just, oh, when you have a system, when you're in a fear state, you're less likely to trust. When you have process heavy and project management heavy systems, you're trying to create compliance. Mm. And that is what you want in a Taylorist factory environment. You want compliance. You don't want variation inside the system. Variation inside the system is terrifying um, because we're, you, you, we're just trying to create stuffed animals or chairs well, we or cars or whatever. associate variation with error. Exactly, right? And, and so you go to command and control, right? Coordination and control approaches to your systems because it's like, hey, look, I can't trust anybody, so I'm just going to lock everything down and make sure that this is where we're going. And it's back to that root of fear. The unfortunate reality is that that is the exact time where you're trying to build a game. You don't know what it is. You don't know what's going to work. The environment is going to change while you're building it. Um, there's going to be other games that are released that might be competitors that you have to react to. There's going to be all these things. Players are going to actually start playing it at some point, hopefully well before it's launched, and they're going to give you feedback. Can you respond to it? Um, all those things are what you, you should be focusing on, but instead you're responding out of fear and you're moving towards control and compliance. And when there, there's the story, Aaron, and I've told a million times, um, I, I thought my job was process when I got to Riot and I started working because everybody seemed to look at me as like, oh, you're the process guy, right? You're the guy who's going to. And then when I, as I kept going, I was like, my job isn't process, it's alignment. Because what would happen over and over and over is they'd come in and they'd say, I need you to solve these process problems. And I would ask like, okay, product lead, owner, manager, whatever your title or role is. Um, where are you trying to go? Stakeholders, where are you trying to go? Team, where are you trying to go? If I could, from the customer or audience of this thing, the players, what do they want? And I would say, like, you're all going four different directions. Let's pick one and go in it. And maybe it's the way the product owner wanted, and maybe it's the way the stakeholders wanted, and maybe the stakeholders were all different. We had to align them. And once we were aligned, suddenly all the process problems that we had that were a big deal started to sort of vanish on their own. because. We were trying to use process. Every part of that system was trying to use process to force its vision on everyone else. They were attempting to force compliance. And no one was doing this. It wasn't like they were a bunch of malicious people trying to run over everybody else. This was the tool they knew. And they were trying to like, Look, we're not going the right way. So how do we make it happen? Well, I'll put some processes in to make sure that every time before anybody makes a decision, they ask me. And that's going to be a process. It's going to be a step on definition of done. And so now I'm actually slowing our ability to iterate and work counter and counterproductive in a, in a huge way to the team moving quickly but at least i have control and instead when they were all suddenly able to realize we weren't going in the same direction find a direction and moving it together we didn't need to worry about that anymore 
the process problem, like I said, sort of vanished, became not as big a deal. Yeah, there was still stuff you can tweak and improve and all these different things. But this, there's this idea that we have that like when we're, when we're scared, we need to control things. And the reality is that if you're in creative work, when you're scared, you need to open up. You need to be more open to different ideas. You need to be more collaborative. Doesn't mean you don't make decisions. It means you focus on learning and value more and harder and you let people figure stuff out. And it's a very different frame. Um, but it'll it'll yield much better results. Yeah, so 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 that's really interesting. And and you know one of the things I find, and I, I want to see if you agree, is that you know if you if you take certain processes, and I mean one of my favorite examples is to look at you know like the you know, the, the total pipeline of you know of a certain kind of asset, especially mm -hmm. if you're also going to have some you know some external partners being involved, because you know that adds, adds a little bit of complexity to it, which just makes this example more interesting. And you know and you whiteboard that. Um, it is, it can be quite complex mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, from a tool vendor point of view, you know, one of the things that we identified was that very often the tooling actually makes it even worse, uh, because you typically end up with, you know, very, very linear process, um, where if you would, if you would actually do that analysis that we talked about before, when you're looking at, you know, actual ball and X and how this actually works, a lot of these things are actually more parallel, um, than, than yeah. strictly linear. It, it is more that's parallel than that people typically think. I mean, that's at least what I, what I would argue. And so, so one of the ideas we had was that, well, then how do we, how do we design you know, you know, a tool that, that can support that kind of thinking? So now I'm obviously blowing my own trumpet here, you know, but, but the result that we see is that if I compare, you know, very often I see, uh, you know, how you know, you know, managers in, in, you know, in art, you know, they, they, they are breaking down, you know, the, the work of doing sort of thing. It, it becomes, you know, a, you know, a million tasks, you know, in a, in a, in a ticket tracker, uh, typically Jira and, 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 you know, the whole thing, because it, it's very, very labor intensive and it's very, yes. very focused on, 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 on kind of control. And, and it also creates a full sense of a full sense of control, I would say by, by having done all of that when, when in reality. Uh, it could actually, uh, you know, be actually simpler, you know, as long as, you know, the yes. tool can support it. And, and now I'll stop, you know, blowing the favorite trumpet here. But, <laughs> but, I, but I do want to, you know, ask you if you agree that, um, well, I, I guess my real question is, you know, because you also talked about culture before, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and I want to, you know, ask you a little bit about, you know, you know tools more, more generally, um, you know, on a previous podcast, you know, with, with um, you know, uh, Zoe from, from Timber, you know, she, uh, she made a very good point around that, that, you know, the tools that you choose would actually affect your culture. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. and, and one thing I find is that, um, I feel like I have to evangelize that ID, uh, still, I feel, I feel like yeah. in 2023 yeah. and probably 2024 as well, uh, you know, this is still a pretty new ID, you know, it, it's still something I, I kind of have to sell that ID. You know, I mean, in the game industry, people are typically very, very smart. So normally, you know, if, if I just get a chance to talk about it for, for a minute, people get it, but, but it's not something that seems to be intuitive yet. Um, you know, is this something you agree with and what's your own experience with this? Yeah, well, I th I'd say we agree with that. And, yeah. um, the thing that scares me about that, that I think most leaders still don't understand that, um, is that they're not thinking about the ways or understanding the ways in which a tool or a process might impact the culture. Yeah. And then if it does impact the culture, they have low awareness of it. Again, mm -hmm. back to the stand-up example, like to me, I go into a stand-up and I see everyone like heads down, just giving their update to the scrum master and the scrum master is just taking notes and, and sort of like, okay, good, good job, Jim. Okay. Sally now next to you. And, and it's like completely controlled. Um, that the part that scares me the most is when I recognize that the team and or the leader don't even realize that they're reinforcing all these anti-patterns in the context of that meeting. It's not that like, or a lot of people go in and they're like, well, you're not doing it right. I don't care about that. I care about the fact that you don't recognize that you're not even getting out of this, what you want to get out of this. And that you're actually making it harder for yourself down the road. Because then here's the real scary thing. If that scrum master wakes up all of a sudden, they're like, holy crap, this meeting should be about collaboration and making decisions and helping each other. And they try to pivot that. 
they will have already trained their team for the last year to do nothing but keep their mouths shut and give their update. And so now they're going to have to unwind all that behavior. It's not so yeah. simple as just changing the process. It's like now I have to retrain people to think differently. And that's the yeah. point, right? Well, and this, I, I think, you know, for Aaron and I, as Aaron was just talking about agendas, facilitation techniques, tools, all of these sit into the same bucket of like, these are techniques. And when I think about like, what, what is your process and the different parts of it incentivizing and the people in your team? So often it's like, oh, I didn't really consider that. We just use, you know, you mentioned Handsoft earlier. We just use Handsoft. So mm -hmm. like that's what we bought and we pay for it every month. And so we're all just, we just use Handsoft. And so every time we go and we like update our tickets and we do it like this, I'm like, cool, what's being incentivized? Who updates the tickets? What happens? Why? When? And they're like, I don't think about any of that. I just, my job as a producer is to make sure that every week when I need to run my sprint report or whatever, all the tickets are in the right place. And if they're not, I yell at my team to make sure the tickets are in the right place. And that's how we use this system. And I'm like, okay, are you like, does anybody do anything with the sprint report? I have no idea. Okay. Do you, did you ever ask that? Did you ever understand what decision would be made differently? And this, this is that like, what is the purpose of the work system? What is the purpose of the process? Aaron and I believe it, it's about alignment primarily and secondarily about uh, healthy working relationships. You are creating alignment as a primary function of this. And if you don't know what you're aligning around and you're doing something in a process and nobody knows what you're aligning around, you should stop doing it and figure, <laughs> figure out like what the heck is it that this is for? And, but so I, like, I'll, I'll, I'll give another example of when I first got to Riot. I don't know why that's coming up a lot today. Um, but uh, when I first got to Riot, there was this thing that pr the producer on the team was expected to do, which is there were all these little sub teams of the champion team. It was like a 30 to 50 person group. And there were all these little sub teams and each one had their champion that they were working on. And at any given time, there were like eight or nine champions in development. It was quite a, quite a process. It was, it was an impressive system in a lot of ways. The producer was supposed to go to some number of these meetings, um, which each of the different sub teams had multiple times a week and take notes. And once they've taken their notes, they were supposed to type them up into an email and send it to a change log about that particular champion in development. And I did it um, because I was new. I did it for like a couple of days. And then I, I was like, I'm going to get fired, but I'm not doing this anymore. This is the most worthless thing. Nobody reads these emails. Um, we don't reference this. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Like I said, that was when I learned like someone was talking about VFX. And I was like, what's a VFX? Um, and they were like, oh, he does not know anything. And I'm like, but I'm taking all the notes. Why am I taking the notes? And so I told the team, hey, I'm not going to take these notes anymore, except for the ones I need to take that are relevant for me. If you need to take notes, you can take your own notes in these meetings. And I'm not emailing the change log anymore because it was taking up hours and hours of my day to do this. And I was like, there are actually things here to solve and this isn't helping us do them. But why were we even ever doing that? Well, because at some point someone had started and no one had ever actually stopped and looked at it. And again, like I said, I was brand new. I could have been totally wrong. I was worried I was going to get myself fired, but I was like, I can't, I almost in good conscience, I can't do this. This is not value adding work. This is just checking boxes. And I think that distinction, are we checking boxes or are we doing value added work um, to what, <laughs> what's going on is something that so many people are just like, you know what, I've got my routines and I run them. Um, they make me feel good. They make everybody comfortable. I'll keep doing it. And it's like, no, man, a lot of that's not value. And it's, it's worth noting that Ben and I were reared up as producers in an environment where our bosses, if they found out that we were executing a stupid process that was generating <laughs> no results, we would have been disciplined for that. Like yeah, there are other companies, there are other companies I've seen where, um, if you step back and you say, Hey, this process is stupid. We're getting no value out of it, that you'll be disciplined for that. And that, so, that, that, like that, that shut up, shut riot. up. Yeah. Shut up and do your job. Right. Or, or, or we, we take notes because that's what we do here because basically because reasons. And, and so Ben and I are lucky. We're, a, we're the, we're in the lucky few to have, to have grown up in a company like riot that actually where our bosses were training us and incentivizing us to, to challenge that yeah. like all the time. Yeah. We had phenomenal mentors. No, no doubt. So I, I'm going to make, um, there was a couple of things that you said, um, and, and I, I want to make like a final comment from, from, you know, the connection here with, uh, 
you know, culture and, you know, and tools and, and, and even a little bit of, you know, positive notes and kind of owning the process. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing we talked about, you know, and I, I feel it's the right, you know, since I live in the world of tools, yeah, it's, it's probably, you know, my, my role to make this comment. So, um, so, so what, one of the things that I come across sometimes is, is I get the, the, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I make this point about, you know, the connection between, you know, not only tools and culture, but, but also all these things that you were saying, you know, you know, you know, basically every kind of, you know, process or workflow that you have in a company, uh, you know, is, is, is it in a way a manifestation of, of your, of your culture or the other mm -hmm. way around, it's going to manifest in the culture, you know, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a circle, of course. Yeah. Now, uh, so, so when I, when I, when I'm, you know, when I, when I'm having that conversation, um, you know, sometimes when someone is, uh, you know, um, you know, a bit, a bit, you know, you know, blunt and it, it's good that they are that in, in these situations. I say, well, isn't a tool just a tool? I mean, what's the difference? I mean, Patrick, this, this sounds great what you're saying, but I mean, what's actually the difference here, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, my, 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 my two examples, you know, well, two, two examples I would use would be, would be, I would say, okay, well, first, you know, think about automations, you know, you, you, you know, once you figure out, um, you know, your, 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 your workflow and, and, you know, then, then it is, it, it does make sense to get into automation, but with pretty mm -hmm. much all tools, that means that was, well, you know, that means that you need to contact someone centrally, like the, you know, the, the central GRAD administrator, you know, you basically have to send a ticket to that person to, to, to do some updates and, and to do, you know, um, you know, this automation, et cetera, and, you know, might happen, might not happen, et cetera. Um, if instead the situation is that these automations is something you can actually do yourself, you know, so, so the vendor in, in that case, us, we are putting the effort to make sure that we basically democratize this. So you, you can do this yourself, you know, without, you know, without too much training, you know, then mm -hmm. you can take ownership of that process. So you can also iterate on it, you know, see, that's where it becomes the yeah. difference, right? Okay. Is it centralized or is it like that? The other thing, you know, the thing I'm you know super excited about, you know, right now, um, is, you know, we're rolling out this thing we call, you know, dashboards, which is basically, you know, you know, business intelligence. It's the same thing there. This is typically something which is a very, very centralized, you know, function. You know, you have some, you know, basically kind of a data warehousing approach and you have some people centrally who creates all these shards based upon that and they are important for various decisions. But, you know, again, what's the alternative? Well, again, if, if we can democratize this and put it in the hands of, you know, leaders, all these leaders we're talking about on various levels, and uh, so they can, you know, make this themselves uh, and, and constantly it's already not, you know, then, then, you know, you, you actually, you know, you actually have this kind of like decentralized, you know, it is more autonomous. It, it is more empowered with those leaders. So, so there is a difference, you know, it, a tool is, you know, there is a difference how you can design a tool. Yeah. So, you know, with that point made, I mean, um, you know, no yeah. more plugging favor here. You know, I, I want to get to uh, my final question, which is, um, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, leaders today, um, I'm tempted to say, you know, the upcoming ones, but to be honest, I think this is for everyone, everyone who's, who's, uh, open to learn and, and to change and improve. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that you have been talking about that, you know, you, you've been making, make it very clear, you know, what, what an anti-pattern would look like versus a, you know, you know, good behavior, what a good leadership would look like. Um, you know, how can you, as a, as a leader today, you know, how can you train yourself? Uh, apart from listening to your podcast, I mean, what, mm -hmm. what are the trainings you should do? You know, what are the, um, you know, you know, basically how, you know, if you have this ambition, you know, you know, maybe we inspired someone here today to, to, to actually start thinking a little bit more about this, you know, mm -hmm. how, how, you know, what are the next steps? You know, if you, if you want to, you know, get, get on that path to becoming, you know, really, you know, a, you know, a, a, a leader of the, of, of a modern leader of the future in the game industry. Yeah, uh, there's a couple things that come to mind for me, and, and this is why Ben and I broke it down into the three pillars, because awareness is always the first step, right? So now we've said process going from right to left, uh, least important to most important process, product, vision, alignment, and culture. So for most leaders, ha like taking a step back, making yourself aware of the cultural er element, or as you put it, and as we often put it, Patrick, the behaviors, what are the behaviors? And then the product, like, what is it that we're trying to make? And are we moving in the same direction? Those two buckets are the ones that tend to be underemphasized. So take a step back and ask yourself, how would you assess your team when it comes to those things? How would you assess your company? How would you assess your product? Um, and spend time interacting and engaging in those two buckets. 
Um, Patrick Lencioni is a phenomenal culture author. So if you want to deepen your understanding of culture and see different cultural patterns and see how a leader can interface with behaviors, he's, he's the, he, honestly, he's the master. And uh, he will very quickly get you comfortable with uh, non-definables, like, uh, right. like uh, unknowables from the standpoint of like, be, that one of the things I think scares leaders away from thinking about behaviors is because you can't put it on a chart. And it's really hard to put on a chart. Um, it's something that requires finesse and understanding nuance and paying attention and engaging and interacting. And uh, that the most important thing we're emphasizing is the one that's the least definable scares the shit out of people. And so you need to get comfortable with that. Um, and when it comes to product, one of the things I do when I'm talking to junior leaders is I'll connect them with a team who I think is very well aligned and have them interact with that team. Because once you see that, like a team that's like super charged on collaboration and they just sort of almost read each other's minds. They know exactly what the goal is and they're just moving. And it's almost like you try to come in and put process on a team like that. And, and it just bounces right off them. Like it's almost, it's a distraction. They just, they're just going, um, show them what that looks like. If you have one of those teams in your company, go spend time with them, watch them, observe the way that they interact, uh, and learn how to be aligned and what it looks like to be aligned. For me, um, the book that came to mind, uh, is it's a, it's a military book. It's a Navy book. Um, it's turned the ship around. It talks about a leader and how they transformed culture inside of a particular boat of the Navy, ship of the Navy. They're going to get mad at me, but whatever. I was in the army. Um, I don't mind. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's, it's a great book. Turn the ship around, recommend it. Um, let me see the, the advantage was the one that from Patrick Lencioni. That's great. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Jim Benson's The Collaboration Equation. And if you're looking at just like a, almost a really pragmatic approach to a lot of what we're talking about, Lean from the Trenches by Henrik Nieberg the is- god, The god of all process books, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal because it's so simple in many ways, but it also explains so much of that there's depth here. Um, and I think one of the things I, well, one of the things I encouraged new producers when they arrived um, they, they would often like, you know, chat with a lot of people. And sometimes they would chat with me and they'd come over, we'd have a half hour call, um, or, or chat in person or whatever. And, um, I would tell them, you need to have an understanding of where you are trying to go. And that means like, what does it mean to have a healthy team? And again, not an efficient team, a healthy team. What does it mean to have a healthy team? It's not just everybody's a nine out of 10 on the happiness chart, right? Like it's more than that. Do you know where your goal like takes you? Do you know what the journey is to get there? Because if you can figure out, this is where I want to be. This is where I want my team to be. And this is where I am today. Now you can start going, what are the big steps I can take to move in that direction? Because one of the things that's true of producers and all leaders and almost everybody really in game development, there's always more work to do than will ever be done. There's always going to be more problems to solve in everything. And so it's not about just finding like, oh, that's a problem. I can solve it. If you do that, you're going to make most likely a bunch of random improvements that don't actually lead to anything cohesive and solid and, and, and really force multiply your team. But if you go, wait a minute, we're here right now. Like maybe we're not able to focus well. And then, and my ideal team is one that's able to focus really well and collaborate together. Okay. What would I change about how we're behaving today? that would allow us to focus better. And so don't go and fix some random spreadsheet somewhere or go into your Jira like you were talking about and like start sending tickets to like, I think I can get a smoother. It's like, no, 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 wait, we're not able to focus. That's a collaboration thing. That's a like goal thing. How do I get those things in place? How do I create alignment towards something? Um, that would be what I would start. And then the last, I'll shamelessly plug this. We just made a course called Succeeding in Game Production, What You Aren't Taught, um, where we go into the role of producer as force multiplier, the primary skills of leadership and influence, and uh, provide a bunch of like common challenges, practical tips as well. Um, so if this, if you're, yeah, if you're interested in this sort of thing, that is a course that was trying to help people understand that, hey, I don't go into like, here's your game dev phases and here's what disciplines do or anything like that. It's like, hey, this is the pragmatic stuff that I saw the best producers consistently do. 
um, and that we don't talk about and that we don't teach well. So you can check that out too. So, uh, you know, that course sounds great. I mean, is that online and, and where can, can, where can you find it? It's an online pre-recorded course. Uh, go to buildingbettergames.gg and at the top, you'll see a course. Um, just click on that. It'll take you there. All right. Fantastic. And I was ha happy that you mentioned, you know, Henrik Nieberg. Um, we, we both, um, you know, trained for and, and did, um, the problem solving leadership, uh, one week workshop for the, the late, uh, Jerry Weinberg, you know, they kind of, you know, grandfather of a lot of these practices and, uh, yeah, that's cool. That, that was, that was, that was quite an experience and, and everyone in, you know, we were 12 people and everyone were, um, you know, technical leaders, but very little of the theory and the practices we did had really anything to do with anything technical. It was all really about, you know, how humans actually work much better to get. That's but, so yeah. cool. But, you know, Jerry, he always, you know, I, I think his motto was something like making smart people happier or something like that. So, so you know, he was, he was just, you know, he, he was just recognizing that, well, people in tech tend to be relative, you know, between, you know, from relatively to very, very smart, you know, and, yeah. and you know, how, how do we design something, you know, for, for that group? So, I mean, yeah. any, you know, he I brought, love he, that. Yeah. I love that quote, <laughs> making smart people happier. I think that's such a lovely frame because you were talking about that podcast we did about sort of the resentment and things like that around agility. It scares me when really smart people are not happy with the processes we're making. That scares yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. you know? and, and I should say, I, you know, I, um, you know, when uh, I, I will put the link, you know, at, at various places to, to, to this, uh, this course, um, you know, sounds like, uh, as I said, I mean, I would encourage, you know, any both, you know, um, upcoming or, or senior, um, you know, you know, production leader or any other leader in really in, in game development to, to listen to your podcast, but, you know, taking this course sounds like a, like a really great idea. Uh, you know, guys, it's been absolute pleasure, uh, talking to you. Uh, this is, um, one of the longer podcasts I've done. Normally I'm very, very strict on time, but, but, uh, there was, you know, so much good stuff in what you're saying. So I didn't, I didn't want to, um, you know, you know, limit that. So, you know, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for having us, Patrick. Yeah. We re I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And uh, to all of you, see you in the next one. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, you know what to do. Share it in your social media so more people can take part and learn. And one more thing, check out Favro Academy on favro.com for many more learnings. Thanks for tuning in.